All right. So we give you the notes that are related to, and in your handout, um, it's the bullet point, second part of the uh, Mao years, its right to rebel, 1960 to 1976. So we've got a lot of things going on here in communist China during this time period. Um, in 1961, the Communist Party institutes a new mass campaign, right? We've seen all these different mass campaigns. So we know it's instituted from the top and it's implemented through all of the villages and towns and cities and all the work units. Boom, here's the mass campaign. You ready? It's called, Remember the Bitter Past and Think of the Sweet Present. So this is like a propaganda campaign of the government, the Communist Party, to get people to talk about how great things are now, as in like 1961. And then the bitter past. What do you suppose, Libby, what do you suppose the bitter past is supposed to refer to? What time period? Right, the bitter past, the time it wasn't good. Could you give me some dates? I'll, be, I'll help you out here. Before 1949 or like, you know, the 1950s? That's right. Make sure you write that down. Because before 1949, who was in charge of China? Livy, who was in charge of China? Or who wasn't in charge of China? Mao was in charge of China after 1949. So the idea here is this is going to be a propaganda thing to go, hey, look, <laughs> the communists have been in charge now for what, you know, 11 years? And things are great now. And so let's talk about how bad things were under, you know, during the time of the Civil War and the Nationalists and all that kind of stuff. And then now things are great. So if you have this discussion, have you ever opened up a discussion with somebody and it didn't quite turn out the way you thought it was going to be? So if you really say, let's talk about the bitter past, here's what was actually happening in some of these villages and so forth. What were they thinking of that was really bitter and really awful? Yeah, like the last couple of three years. Yeah, under the Great Leap Forward. Was that what the government wanted you to talk about? Heck no, because that would be critical of Mao. Don't talk about that, right? So, I mean, but here's the problem. It's like, <laughs> you're like, hey, let's, what's really bad? And you're like, oh, let me think. Should I really say what's on my mind? <laughs> Should I really tell him? What do you think? Does Mao really want you to say what's on your mind? No, at least not in that instance, unless he's trying to direct you to say what's on your mind and be critical of somebody else. He, he's okay with that, right? Let 100 flowers bloom. Chew out your teachers. Chew out your local party officials. Da, 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 until I change my mind, and now you're all bad people. Well, we're going to go through another series of that. As it turns out, um, the Communist Party will blame drought and floods for the loss of life, okay? Wow, that's interesting. Hmm. It's kind of like when something really bad happens, <coughs> COVID, who's to blame for that? <laughs> if you're in China, who's to blame for that? America. America, there you go, America, right? So if who's to blame for the Great Leap Forward, 30 million people died. If you even agree that 30 million people died, I mean, that's another thing. Can you rely on the accuracy of the statistics that they're keeping? <laughs> If they're only like sort of, I mean, if a whole bunch of people die in a village and nobody goes into that village, how many people died in the village? Yeah, I mean, they're not going to face up to it. And yet, are there people that know about this? Sure. Here we go. No one is going to hold Mao responsible for the Great Leap Forward. So there's not going to be a wide criticism of Mao and so forth on that. And as long as he's alive, you're not going to hear that. And actually, even today, in China, it, are people really super open to talk about like real big blunders that happened during Mao's leadership? Mm -hmm. Not so much because Mao is the underpinning. He is Mr. Chinese Communist Party. And who is in charge of China today? The Chinese Communist Party. So it's kind of like saying, hey, all those people that wrote the Constitution are a bunch of fools and idiots and they gave us a really bad document. You're like, whoa, that's pretty, you know. I mean, people will say that and so forth. You can say that in our country and so forth. But it's the underpinning. Who is the underpinning of the Chinese communist system? Mao. Okay? So there will be subtle. And in fact, here we go. 
there is going to be, write this down, when Mao decides that he's no longer going to be involved in day-to-day -day government, is that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. Because then what will they do with a great leap forward? They'll get rid of it. <laughs> exactly, they'll get rid of it. And who is going to be in the top kind of like running the country kind of from day to day? If Mao's not doing it, Liu Shaoxi, very good. Liu Shaoxi, he's the supposed sort of number two guy. And folks like Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai, okay? These guys are more practical when it comes to economic policies and so forth, all right? They're not as radical in thinking, hey, let's work, 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 work. So, here are some of the things that they do. They start to develop a focus on consumer goods, all right? So it's not just like industrial, industrial, industrial and make crappy steel. Actually focus on developing consumer goods, because who likes consumer goods? People do. Toys and stuff and clothes and things, yeah. This is going, Mao leaves, kind of kind of goes on a sort of extended vacation. Notice he is initiating this himself. This would be like 61, the ender part of 61, okay? So, Mao goes off on the vacation and he's not involved in day-to-day -day affairs. So who's left kind of in charge of running the country? Liu Xiaoxi, Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, those kind of guys. And what, what do they think of the Great Leap Forward? They don't think it's doing such a great job. So what do they do? They kind of sideline it. And then they focus on some more practical things. Here's another practical thing. Um, they encourage peasants to make, do some farming on the side where they can um, you know, make money doing a little bit of extra. Oh my gosh, wow. Profit incentive? If the peasants work a little bit more beyond what they're doing for their entire you know, collective farm, they get to actually keep the benefit of their work? How many of you guys like that idea? That you get the benefit of the work you do? I don't know, actually, would it be a good idea to have like a collective score, IB score, for the students at North Star? <laughs> Come on, everyone, together, work together for the betterment. I mean, some of the things you're like, oh, we'll all pitch in for, I don't know, this, that, and so forth, but something as essential as, I don't know, your IB scores, who should get the, who should, who should do the work that you get the benefit from? Yeah, how about that? That's America. That's where we're, we're an individualistic country here. We'll all work together for this, that, and so forth. Although, I don't know, if you're on a team, right? If you're on a team, what do they put up? Do they just put your name up there or do they put like the team name up there? The team. So sometimes like, there's no I in team. There is, off of cross country. Well, it's a different sport. Yeah, it's a different sport, right? I mean, it's really weird when you like, like if you've got a team and somebody's trying to get some individual recognition and the rest of the team's like, showboat. I mean, they're not really happy about that. Like, pass the ball, right? I mean, you pass it to the really good shooter if he's going to help the team. But if the really good shooter is actually going to help the best rest of the team by passing it off, what should they do? Pass it off, because the really good shooter is going to get double teamed and everything like that. Anyway, this is so, so individuals make some money on the side by doing a little bit of extra farming on the side and so forth, right? So here we go. What is Mao doing in the early 1960s? He's studying the economic classic, or excuse me, the Chinese classics, and guess what he puts into his regular cultural <laughs> thing? Dance parties. <laughs> yeah. Dance parties. I want to say, this is quoting from the video, and this is the doctor, right, who wrote the, like, the biography of, of Mao. Every Wednesday and every Saturday, and a special room is set up for Mao so that he could dance, or so that he could rest for an hour with the young participants that are uh, in that. Anyway, that's Mao. So, like, just have your dance parties, okay? Um, but meanwhile... He's, since he's not in the public eye so much, what are people in the country, especially young people who are coming of age, what do they think of Mao? He is like a god. 1963, he turns 70 years old, all right? And he starts thinking, 
I've got some plans. And he starts putting these plans together. All right? Mal starts putting these plans together, and it's not going to involve these people. It is going to involve, to a degree, his wife, Jiang Xing, and it's going to involve another man I'm going to introduce you to right here, Lin Biao. All right? Lin Biao. Write his name down. Lin Biao is the Minister of Defense. So he's a top communist official, and he's more radical. He's, um, you know, he's, he looks at, you know, this sort of like, he, and he would look at some of the stuff that, you know, Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping and those guys are doing and going, eh, you're starting to get some creeping capitalism into your system here. This is not really good for the long term. And so he likes Mao's radicalism. In fact, what does he do? He starts to help develop the so-called cult of Mao. And this is not entirely foreign to China, because in Chinese history, imperial history, you would have emperors, and they would be looked at not only as the head of the government, but they were never elected. They would be looked at as like heaven, yeah, exactly, divine right, heaven on earth, right? And so here we go. We got a Chinese communist official who ironically fits very much into that religious personage he is the one who people will look to, particularly young people who are coming of age. And how does Lin advance this? In 1964, here we go. In 1964, Lin Biao collects and publishes a work called The Quotations from Chairman Mao. Okay? The Quotations of Chairman Mao. From Chairman Mao, excuse me. He publishes The Little Red Book. And if you're thinking, is that like Holy Scripture? Might as well be, because these are the words from Mao Zedong. And that's like Scripture. This is Mao's version of everything, communism, everything. And actually, if you go through and study, be careful who you, uh, <coughs> if you went through and studied it at that time, you go, well, let me see, I think he contradicts himself from here versus like here. No, no, Mao doesn't contradict himself. Does Mao contradict himself? We can all say today, why, yes, he did. <laughs> Should people speak their mind? Yes, when Mao wants you to speak his mind, your mind. Should people refrain from criticism? Yes, when Mao wants you to refrain from criticism. So which is it? What is it, a blue day or a green day? I mean, it's like, what, you know, which is this? All right? Now, since this is, you know, it's kind of like he's always right. He's always right. The cultural, they'll come up with songs. They'll, like, introduce as part of the day, almost like features where you stop. It's almost like this, like a, an Islamic, like, prayer thing. You know, you pray to Mecca five times a day. You'll stop and do the Mao loyalty dance. You'll, see, you'll hear the thing. <laughs> Even if you're on an airplane, they'll stop and they'll do the, the flight attendants. will do the Mao loyalty dance and so forth for you. Okay? This is Paul the, called the cult of Mao. And of course, meanwhile, you know, you're, you're the other top communist officials, and you're like, can we, oh gosh, I hope this doesn't blow up on our face. Is this going to blow up on our face? Is it? Is it? Is it? Yes, it is. 1966, write it down. 1966. In 1966, Mao makes a comeback. The return of Mao. Mao looks and he's like, I don't really like. Yeah, I don't really like how Liu Xiaoxi and Zhou Enlai and whatever is running the country. I mean, granted, people are actually feeding themselves and things are going a little bit better, but it's missing something. What does Mao want? Radical. He wants radical. He wants radical, radical, radical. He says that what this country should be about, you ready? Write this down. A continual revolution and struggle. Continual revolution and struggle. You want the struggle. Yes, because that's vibrant. It's powerful. It's mmm, and all the other stuff is sort of like. Mm. I mean, in your life, in your life, are you have you been working hard this year? Are you going to continue working at this same pace your entire life? Probably not. Are you going to continue working at the same pace during the uh, summer vacation? Are you going to like chill back and relax and sort of, I'm like, 
I mean, is there ever going to be a point in time in your life where you'd be like, okay, I have arrived to a certain degree. I don't have to take tests anymore. I don't have to write papers anymore. You want to keep doing it? You want to have your life to be a continual struggle? You and Mao? All right, well, you need to get one of the little red books and talk about this. Right? And so guess who Mao concludes? Write this down. Guess who Mao? Landon. Who does Mao conclude is an obstacle to this wonderful continual revolution and struggle? No, not himself. <laughs> And the Communist Party itself. Yes, write it down. And the Communist Party itself. What? Oh, he's, he's above communism. He is. And all the other people that pretend to be part of the Communist Party, he's like, no, they don't share my radical views. He, in May of 1966, he officially launches the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Proletarian meaning workers, bless you, sometimes referred simply as the Cultural Revolution. Starts in 1966 and it's going to continue on give and take for quite a few years. I mean, there'll be aspects of it that will go all the way up until he dies. Okay, so what does this mean? He encourages young people to attack the party. doesn't it? Struggle meetings. They need to organize and attack the party and replace them with radicals and revolutionaries. Now, among the party leaders, there actually are two that you can identify as radicals, okay? And those are going to be, you ready? Jiang Xing. Just think of her as a radical. She's going to be like, I like this stuff. <laughs> Finally, my husband has got this really, really good idea. And besides that, she really can't stand some of the other people like Liu Xiaoxi, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai. Hmm. You ever been in a gathering where people like, you're like, they're smiling at me, but they hate me. That's going to be some of this, like, top communist officials. You're like, oh, I don't like, I try to stay away from those gatherings, to be honest. Um, and who also was a radical? The other key radical is going to be Lin Biao. Okay? So he's pushing the cult of Mao. He likes the cultural revolution. He wants these top uh, officials to be hmm, removed. Who is encouraged? Who are the foot soldiers of the cultural revolution? Young people. In fact, it's kind of like, guess what, kids? School's going to be a little different this year. Instead of going to school, you're going to. <laughs> you're you're going to get on the road and you're going to form little groups. Uh, they're going to be called, um, let me see, Red Guard. Okay? Red Guard units, young people, Red Guards. And where are they going to go? They're going to go all over the place. They're going to go here. They're going to go there. They're going to go all over the place. And they're going to spread Mao Zedong thought. Now, how do you spread Mao Zedong thought? You go into a village. You've got your drums. You've got your instruments. You've got your books. I don't know how often you read it. You've got your books. And then you have the villagers identify, for example, who needs to be struggled with. This is where payback comes back, and it's a bear, right? Because if you're a local official who kept sending the grain to meet the government quotas and people around you were starving, you know what the people around you that actually didn't starve to death think of you? They hate you. And what are they going to do when they see a bunch of young people coming in spreading Mao Zedong thought? They're going to say, it's time for a struggle meeting with you, local communist official. It's going to get ugly. What about the top leaders? Um, yeah, here we go. The top leaders are going to have a real hard time because let's go back to this picture. Mao Zedong is going to basically sort of say to everyone, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm ready to be active it again. He's 73 years old in 1966. And in order to prove that he's healthy and so forth, he's like, I'm going to go for a swim. In the Yangtze River, he goes for a swim. It's a highly publicized swim. So he's swimming in the river. And the message is, it's like, hey, he's back. And he's swimming. Let's just keep swimming. And he's back. And he's going to be involved. So he shows up to the top communist official meeting. Right? You got 
Liu Xiaoxi on the stage. Can you imagine Liu Xiaoxi on the stage talking to all these different communists about economic policy and so forth? All right? Mao is backstage. This is one of the scary moments in the video. Mao's backstage, and he's talking about this, that, and so forth. And Mao says to him, you're a counter-revolutionary. You're like, oh, no, the boss has spoken. The boss is going to start sicking people on me. Write it down. Liu Xiaoxi is demoted to the number eight position. Deng Xiaoping is demoted to the number six position. Who's going to be up, uh, uh, promoted to the number two position? Exactly. Lin Biao is going to be promoted to the number two position. And I tell you what, Liu Xiaoxi is going to have to watch his back. Because there are folks out there that are trying to get massive groups of young people to have struggle meetings with him. Yes? Oh, sorry. That was just a, that was like, a, um, like a promotional thing to show that Mao's healthy. Oh, no, 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 no. It was just a, it was just a photo op. Yangtze. Yeah. yeah, it's a big, you know. You got the Wang Ha, you know, you got the Yellow, it was also known as the Yellow River, yeah, anyway. So it's basically sort of saying, I'm back. So imagine this, okay, maybe the analogy is not very good. Let's say the year's 2024, right? And there is a political leader who used to have great power in Washington, D.C. And he says, I'm running for president. Bernie who? <laughs> Bernie Sanders, there we go, Bernie Sanders. So we'll have Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and let's see, any other old people? That Mitt Romney will jump in there, so we'll get all the different old people who are running for president, and Joe Biden running for re-election and so forth, and some of you guys are like, wait a minute, how about a 35-year-old? Anyway, so, is it going to get chaotic from here on? Next time when we get together, chaos will reign. Oh my gosh, it is going to be messed up. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, 400,000 people dead? Yeah. Oh, not like the Cultural Revolution. No, not, not even close. 